In a world where the line between pleasure and destruction is blurred, a new threat emerges from beyond the stars. Oh my God! Oh my God! Aliens, hell bent on the annihilation of humanity. They're back. When they stuck that probe up your ass, it caused a telepathic link between you and the aliens. What do you mean? Come with us now. The world needs you. To do what? We need you to bang, and bang as hard as you've ever banged before. All right, I, I could do that, yeah. That sounds good. Now, the fate of the world rests in their loins. We don't have the technology to shoot them out of space, but we can telepathically bang them off course and explode. You're asking me to go to a warehouse in the middle of nowhere and have sex with loads of strangers? I'll do it. Mr. President, I'll do it. Well, yeah, I'll definitely do that. The Big Bang. Because I'm not shooting blanks. Coming soon to a theater near you. There's just one question. What's your kink? <laughs> Tough titties. We don't. Oh. The best bits. Or whatever. Can I tell you, I've watched two things that I've absolutely loved over the last two weeks. It's about the only thing I can do to share. Are we on mic? We are on mic. Okay. There's a microphone in front of your face. I know that, but it's about, like, when do we drop in? Can I share with you two things that I've watched that I've loved? Okay. I was hoping we could have a more interesting conversation. I want to tell it's you It's like things. you get on mic and just say like, I watched this the other day, it was very good. Oh, that's good. I watched this, it was very good. Oh, that's good. Let's have a proper I conversation. Only, I only have two things and then we can have a proper conversation. All right? That's it. I've watched John Wick 4 in succession. Oh. Top that. So we, we, let's, let's flip flop. Top that. Did you like any of them? Succession is a fucking delight. I love Succession. I watched this the other day. It was very good. Oh, that's good. The thing that I enjoy the most about Succession is I have no clue what's going on or where it's going or who I'm rooting for, but I just love the interplay and the back and forth. The shows are just like overflowing with great one-liners and cutting barbs and the performances are just so like on point. It's It really is just a joy to watch. You are right. And I was just, I just watched it before we came on and I was, ch- what? You are right. This this is boring. We should just have a conversation. <laughs> Go on. I'm enjoying hearing about succession because I'm F- looking off. <laughs> That's what you said to me before I said I have two things to talk about. I'm looking forward to succession. I'm glad to know. Your face has given me a headache. Uh, well, that, you wouldn't be the first person to say that to me today. Also, I'm not the first person to say it at all because that's just a line from succession. Oh, okay. Coating, so it's that to shiv. Oh, okay. I'm looking forward and to it. And it made awesome. me laugh. It's like your face is giving me a headache. <laughs> uh, I can't. That, that's what we left off. Where we kind of um, conflated. I'll tell you. I'll tell you one thing. Right. That's not going to spoil the episode. Better not. But do you, do you get what I mean, though? When I say that, I don't know where this is going. This is the final season. Yeah. And I, you're watching Game of Thrones, and you're hoping that they're going to kill the, the ice giant or the ice man or whatever, and you want one of them to get on the throne, but you're not sure which. But you sort of have a clear horse that you're backing. Yeah. And on this, I don't have any horse in the race, but I'm enjoying the fucking, the centurions just smashing the shit out of each other. So, Cousin Greg turns up at Roy's birthday party. Okay. This isn't a spoiler. No, I'm not spoiling anything. I wouldn't even be able to spoil the show because I don't understand what's going on. But, um, Cousin Greg brings a girl to Roy's birthday party and the hangers on and the flunkies are immediately going like, who the fuck is she? Get rid of her. She can't be here. She could be like an informant. Do you know what's going on? We're in the middle of a negotiation and you're bringing some girl that you want to hook up with. And he's like, oh, you know, she's just cool and blah, blah, blah. And I'm a cousin. I get a plus one. Anyway, he disappears off with her and they they have a fumble in one of the bedrooms. Right. And Cousin Greg comes back Oh, God, what's Matthew McFadden's character called? Tom. That he had a fumble in the bedroom. And Tom is like, oh, my God, you absolute moron. Why did you do that? And he's like, why? What, what, what are you on about? It's great. She's a minx. And he's like, you went and had 
sex with her in Roy's house. He's this whole place wired with cameras. Oh, you're God. gonna have to tell him because you just basically made a sex tape, and at the end of the night, he's gonna be looking through it with a scotch, and he's gonna see you. And he's like, "Oh my God, are you serious?" And he's like, "Yeah, you're gonna have to tell him." And it's just, <laughs> it's just funny because it's just Tom being really evil to Greg, and, like, <laughs> and Roy's in the middle of another meltdown, and Greg's like, um, "Can I, can I speak to you, please?" Uh, in private <laughs> and he comes back and he, he says to Tom he goes I think it went well he said I'm disgusting and despicable <laughs> but he did it with a smirk on his face and he's like so I think it went well but uh, yeah it just made me laugh I love the show Succession is top quality telly and um, I'm glad that we got a chance to talk about it on this episode because now nobody will listen to this episode because they don't want to be spoiled on Succession <laughs> I loved Tom and Greg's relationship throughout the previous seasons. They, even though Greg is basically bullying, uh, no, Tom is basically bullying Greg throughout. And then when Tom goes off and is with Shiv, he's the sniveling little lackey. <laughs> and he's just, he's just this despicable little shit. Uh, yeah, it's just so rich and it's so much fun. Do you have any cousins like that? Do I have any cousins like Greg? Who goes... Uh, Sniveling shits. Oh, so I thought you were talking about ones who do... Uh, who have sex with dates in, or in our bedrooms and stuff like that. I don't give him half a chance. Oh, my God. Wouldn't let him in the door. So that's succession. What have you been watching? Okay. Well, I've watched <laughs> two things that I said, I'm going to hold off and wait until I'm talking to, talking to Kevin on the best bits, whatever. I didn't even mention them on WhatsApp to you because I said, no, I'm going to save chatting about them or even on the Discord. One is a show on Disney Plus, and it is Fleischman is in trouble. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I've watched most of it with Karen, and I think it's actually great. I think it's really fucking good. It stars Jesse Eisenberg and Lizzie Kaplan and Claire Danes. It's about, it's based on a novel, and the odd thing is, it's showrun by the author of the novel, which is unusual. Her name is uh, Taffy Brodesser Ackner. That's her name. Taffy Brodes- Brodesser Ackner. She sounds working She's class. She's a journalist by day. She wrote this novel that came out a couple of years ago. <laughs> and she, and it's a damn good show. It's fucking compelling. Really compelling. On the surface, it seems like something you wouldn't... Like that I... It might irk me. Because it's about a couple. Jesse Eisenberg and Claire Danes. Who are this say um, upper middle class New York couple there's no such thing as upper middle class in New York they're upper upper class upper upper class yeah well actually she's upper upper class and you would think that would be irritating and you would hate these people but in actual fact it, the, the the show is painted with such which the characters are painted in such sympathetic, sympathetic terms that you are totally on their side and characters I don't like the artwork to it it looks very twee and sun dancey I, I think it's I don't I think it's been sold incorrectly. I think it's been the artwork because I saw the the artwork on Disney Plus and it looks like a Woody Allen type film and it's not yeah. at all that. It's more of a por- portrait of characters characters that you can you can side with very very quickly. And Is it like a marriage story? Not as bleak as a marriage story. There's definitely elements of humor in there. The what what I found fascinating is that at the at the central core of any good series. There has to be good central dramatic question. Like you were saying there with Game of Thrones and Succession. Like Game of Thrones is like, who's going to sit on the throne at the end of this? And even at the end of Succession, Succession is similar. Who's going to be... Yeah, who's going to succeed? Yeah, who's going to succeed? And there is a compelling... Who's going to success? Who's going to success? <laughs> <laughs> and at the end of the episode one of Fleischman is in trouble, there is a compelling what the fuck is going on moment. And that drives the show forward where you, I found myself leaning in each episode. And even though I was absolutely exhausted and I couldn't barely keep my eyes open, I wanted to see the end of each episode. So um, that's what you've been doing instead of responding to my texts. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I just go, okay. I'm, just, I'm watching the show. So I'm recommending it. I think it's excellent. I think it's really, really good. I think everyone should give it a go. It's an excellent show. Okay. I'll think about it. Yeah. Uh, I watched John Wick 4. Right. Okay. How, where do you stand in the John Wick series up to now? Tell me all about that. Give me your history. I enjoy watching them 
I went into John Wick 4 and I thought, oh, this was a mistake because I didn't have a fucking clue what was going on. Okay. It just picks up directly from the last one. Keanu Reeves is galloping through the desert on a horse and he's shooting at people. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? And they're all talking about this and that and what they got to do and they're running out of stuff and they're doing all their usual like ancient aliens mythology where they're flipping over big massive fucking egg timers and they're looking at scrolls and it's all bollocks. It's absolute nonsensical bollocks. And I thought, I don't have a fucking clue what's going on. But boy, does it look pretty. Well, that's the main thing. And that that is the, that is the saving grace for the John Wick movies. They are like diamonds diamond jewelry i'm looking at it and thinking god that is yeah that looks really expensive and beautiful but i don't really want to wear diamonds so i don't really have any connection to them i just recognize that that's a very pretty diamond necklace yeah and that's how i feel with the john wick films they're like the most beautifully put together intricate stylish films where i don't really care but i enjoy looking at them I get that. I enjoyed the first one. They're like car ads or hotel ads for like Dubai. They're really pretty looking, yeah. And and Stunt reels. The thing about it as well is the fact that so much of it is practical. That's enjoyable in itself. That when you see stunt people actually throwing each other over each other's shoulders and stuff like that. And that's impressive. I like that. Yeah, it's like it's like 500 Bond henchmen just battering shit out of each other nonstop. Is it like four hours long? No, it's three, but it felt four hours. Oh my God, it's three hours long. I was joking about four hours. Fuck, it's three hours long. Yeah. Oh my God. Like I, okay, I all I remember is enjoying the first one. Second one went, eh, they're stretching this concept out a bit, you know, further than it, ever, it was ever intended to be extended. And then the third one, I went, oh, this is just bullshit. Because this was not the one which... Uh, yeah, but didn't you didn't you find it really pretty looking? Oh, definitely. Oh, listen, it was gorgeous to look at. But it's a whole slapping this kind of like mythology and lore upon it that just and it wasn't there something they about go it, even deeper on that it's a, there's a hotel where you you know in the hotel yeah. there's like some sort of pharaoh or something the like continental. that continental yes yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 yeah. so uh they blow up the continental at the start of the film oh okay right oh jesus I, should, yeah. I need to be there i need to be there <laughs> would you recommend me uh getting myself a visa a cinema visa pass and going to see it from the no. family okay they're better things. No, because you just said you didn't like the last one. So yeah, I found them. I found them quite, um, you know, a little bit tedious. Eventually, pretty looking, but tedious. Well, diamonds are a girl's best friend. There we go. Uh... Hey man, that reminded me of the other thing, and it connects into the other thing that I saw. That I said oh, I fucking love this, and I'm going to talk to Kevin about it. You're talking about uh, make, make it, it fun, fun and entertaining because this is a very boring, boring episode. episode so segregation. <laughs> Segregation. segregation you're like saying make it fun this is a conversation it's a conversation we're chatting we're having a chat it's called OJ Made in America right this is a thing this is a documentary it's on I think it's on Disney Plus as well that's where I watched it right it was made in 2016 and it was it is the most compelling bit of no come here to me all I really knew about OJ was he was Nordborg in the Naked Gun movies he was good and that was as far as it went. Never knew it. And then there was something about him in the truck driving down the highway very slowly and a load of police behind him. Okay. And I kind of went, oh yeah, there was the trial and all that sort of stuff. And I didn't really pay much attention to it, but I knew it was big news and all that sort of stuff. But holy shit, the documentary OJ Made in America, which is a five part documentary. And each part. That's quite old, isn't it? 2016. Each part yeah. is a feature film. Each part is a fucking feature. Did you ever film. see the did you ever see the um one that what's his face? David Schumer. Does, uh, does, yes, David Schumer starred in it. No, because I was again I was That was brilliant. That was really good. Um that's because I was like going, oh, I'm not I kinda know what OJ's about. I kinda know what what's going on here. No, it's really, really good. This is incredible because it repaints OJ. It repainted OJ totally for me. By the end of episode one. It was kind of, it highlighted OJ, why OJ was the most famous black man in America in the 70s and 80s. Like he was bigger than Muhammad Ali. He was a fucking icon. And by the end of it, I was going, oh my God, that man is the most charismatic, talented, 
amazing human being and I don't care how many people he killed they, they, we should give him a bit of slack because he was amazing But and they also concurrently tell what that about story Bill Cosby he was pretty big <laughs> he was pretty big as well no OJ was bigger OJ was bigger He but OJ fucking did break down barriers it's fucking interesting but they parallel they tell a story give him his, his flowers story. I mean god there's so much negativity just let him <laughs> yeah now by the end of it let me put it to you this way by the end of it the, a different portrait of OJ is is painted and I'm go, shocked holy shit yeah but not just not just oh he probably did it he probably did it but more aspects to his did you ever time. see the crime scene photos I did because I watched the documentary two weeks ago yeah or yeah whenever I watched it I mean after you see that it's like oh my god What's, what was fascinating about it is how the documentary parallels the story of racial tension in LA between the black community and the LA, LAPD and I, I in episode one I was like going why are they kind of telling so, spending so much time talking about you know racial inequality in LA and OJ's story and the two stories converge brilliantly you know in the when everything goes to shit yeah of course because it was one side versus the other and unfortunately for the black community they had to watch a hero crumble and geez wasn't there the um the Rodney King the Rodney yeah. King beating as well it's really place. fascinating it, it's an amazing murder trial like it's fucking compelling to cast the characters they have involved it's fucking class and there's a cast of characters involved that are that are really they're just they're they're like they've come stepped out of a fucking movie and you have they have interviews with these people who you kind of go holy shit I can't believe you're you're reliving this whole thing now live on camera for this docu- documentary it just it feels like a real expose and a real amazing portrait of 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 that case but how pivotal that case was culturally in America in in the late 90s it was amazing I loved it cool <laughs> Come on, let's have a proper conversation. You've been watching a lot of murder documentaries lately. Are you enjoying watching murder documentaries? <laughs> I am enjoying. I always enjoy watching murder documentaries, Kevin. It's my it's my go-to relaxation buzz. Do you not enjoy a good murder doc? Yes, if I'm in the right headspace for it, but I also don't enjoy watching I'm getting really tired of the formula that's on Netflix with the the crime exposé documentaries. The OJ thing, I could definitely tell the difference of it being made before, let's say, the making a murderer thing. It has a different, it, it is a more mature, it has a more mature aesthetic about itself. So, uh, yeah, it's very good. April Fool's Day is coming up. Do you have any plans for any pranks you want to put out there into the world? Oh, God. I'm not. Uh, the only person I used to prank was my mother. That was it. <laughs> That was it. <laughs> Ringing her up and saying you're the Avon lady. Yeah. And yeah. I just, yeah, I miss that. Uh, I... The only really successful prank I've ever done was one that I think I've told you just before. Yeah. Um, I would tell a few friends of mine because, you know, we keep up the tabs with what, what we used to. Jeez, that was one thing I used to like was you get to share your work with other people mates who are also writers or directors and stuff yeah and they'd be able to read it because they'd have the time and you'd get feedback or you'd you just get the immediate buzz, buzz of like having a sort of like a writer's group no that never happens you only share the stuff with the people that are going to nag you to death <laughs> with notes yeah but i knew what each of my mates was working on or was up to and i would send her a message going like um i don't want to to bum you out but I'm just after reading a script which is really similar to your project that you're doing oh god and I go like um, so I don't know I have the script if you want to take a look at it it might be totally different but you know just based on what you were telling me it seems to be almost exactly the same as what you're doing and they'd be like oh my god fuck no send it to me and I would make up a fake PDF yeah. and a fake title and I'd send it to them and then on the first page when you open the PDF it would be like April Fool's gotcha. <laughs> you bastards. <laughs> you but it bastard. was, it's one of those pranks where it's harmless yeah. and it gives them an immediate release yeah. of relief where it's like, oh, thank Christ. Yeah. But that that 
I caught so many people with that, and uh, that is a good one. I've never really, I've never really pulled off any other pranks. Uh, yeah, I only ever did it to my mother. Um, I, I remember there was neighbors of ours. Oh Jesus Christ! There was a neighbor of mine, Donald, and Donald was an awful prankster. And this is back in the, back in the eighties and nineties. He pranked our other neighbors, who they had a fam. Uh, they heard, well, what's their name? They had, they did, there was a fam, four kids and two parents. And they had booked a holiday, let's say, off the coast of Kerry, right? But to, to get there, like back in the day, you would pack everything. You would pack the sink, you'd pack the the, the the armchair, you'd pack the telly and all that sort of stuff. So they had everything packed into the car the night before. The whole bloody lot in there. And Donald rang them the night before because he was at their house. He saw the car being packed and fully packed and, talk, and heard how much stress and bother they, they'd gone to to actually pack the car. And he rang him pretending to be the campsite and told him uh, how are you I'm from the campsite uh, just to let you know that the, the, the water's been cut so you'll have to bring your own water for the week for washing and drinking and everything so they went and they unpacked half the boot and they filled up like barrels of water and put the barrels of water into it and headed off with the with half the boot and let- oh no yeah. you don't let him go that far yeah, with it yeah yeah. Oh. that reminds me I have um, a fishing scam uh, thing that I have been running for a few years it's a nigerian prince thing and i just send out these emails <laughs> to people and the amount of people that fall for it it's hilarious oh hey uh we asked listeners the last time to send us in questions via the uh website and i have got one here shall i read it and ask you it because we can both answer it but i'll ask it shall you. i i like that you say shall i because i got bullied for that in school as a kid oh really I yeah. have no idea why I say it. I know where I don't know where it came into my lexicon or anything. You also say schedule. I've Do noticed I? that about you. Yeah, yes. I have no idea. What's the correct way of saying it? What's our way of saying it? There isn't a correct way, but I've only ever heard it schedule. Schedule. No, I would never say schedule. I always say schedule. I don't. Know. I do not know why. I've noticed that schedule is the English way of pronouncing it, and schedule is the American and Irish way of saying it. Oh, just okay. the way I've heard it. Just going back to my ancestral uh, roots. But yeah, I remember all. putting up my hand in, in the class and the blinds needed to be pulled down because I was getting blinded and I said um, shall I pull down the blinds and one of the little sprats was like shall I shall I uh. and I was like well what am I supposed to say and he was like can I <laughs> he turned around and punch you kick you <laughs> no he was sitting he was sitting a few s- s- seats away from me uh, hey I have my own I have an email in from Joe in Toronto can I can I read this do read it Joe says I'm a recent fan and love your podcast hey, this is a mini review thanks Joe I discovered while visiting in Ireland at Christmas and I have been working my way through your old episodes and really enjoying them my question is I recently loved your origin episodes and after listening to them I watched your films fair play to you they were very different from each other both were brilliant I don't know uh, <laughs> if you've told the story be- before I've only done one film well, how can they both be brilliant <laughs> I don't know if you've told the story before in the podcast, but how did you become friends? Also, you both mentioned Are in we your friends. Or- it's a good question. Also, you both <laughs> mentioned on your origin episodes that you would do follow ups to those. Anyway, how did we become friends, Kevin? We haven't. I don't think we've discussed it on the podcast. How did that? Where did we fatefully meet? It was coppers. It was coppers, wasn't it? Yeah, in the toilets. Yeah. <laughs> we, we are bored after the same woman and uh, coppers is squared up to each other. <laughs> yeah no 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 okay you tell me I know my recollection okay I think we first met we were asked I was asked to do a panel and was it the, was it a Cork Film Festival or something like that years and years ago and you I also believe were that on the panel was, yes with two other panelists and in after, the Triscoll Arts Centre wasn't it yes that was it yeah 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 and afterwards we went for a nice walk this is about well, it's after Grabber's oh, Code. Um, okay, so that would be... 2012. 2012. 2013. And then we took a walk by the Lee, and I remember Kevin's hand just reaching over and his little pinky finger touching my pinky finger. And we had to twice. That wasn't fingers. my finger. <laughs> and we walked. And very soon, we found ourselves in a joint synchronized skip down by the Lee. I remember being asked to be part of that panel, and it was something to... It was something to do with screenwriting, breaking in or something like that. 
Were we all Cork people? Yes, that was... No, one of us wasn't. It was not a Cork people person. There was Cork four people. of us on the panel. There was a, a lady. There was me. There was you. And there was another... Writer, director. Person. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to say who that person is. No, we won't give up the other people's names, no. Just in case. Yeah. Just in case. Because one of them was really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that was it. Was us? It was one of us. It was one of us. Let's no, no, just no. say it. Uh, we we went we went into the um, the little cafe that's in the Trusk Club. We had a cup of coffee and a biscuit, and it was crowded in there. It was absolutely jointed, and I think we had to wait a while until we went on. And it was like, do you want to go for a walk? Or maybe it was after it. Oh, it might have been after it. Yeah, I think you had to get a bus or something like that. And it was like, do you want to go for a walk before you get your bus or something? Oh, and I yeah. remember we did a lap. We did a lap of the Lee up and yeah. down. And I don't know what we talked about, but I just remember us getting on and it was just like, oh, he's just somebody that I could have gone to college with. And it was a really it was really easy to talk to you. How times have changed. Um, <laughs> 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 no, and then we uh, <laughs> Oh God. Um and then we just I don't know, we just stayed in touch. Yeah. At we, that we, stage I was just I was accumulating friends all over the place that were in the business because I'd been so far outside it that to meet anybody that shared the same interests as me, it was like it was so exciting to that sort of know people that you didn't feel like a like a, a weirdo and an outcast. It was like yeah. writing scripts. Everyone used to ask me, What are you writing and I? You could tell it was almost like they were they were trying to um, sympathize with me, like I had a condition. Right. With the help of God, no, Kev. With the help of God. Yeah. I'm like thinking, all right, you don't need to, to cajole and console me. So, um, yeah, it was just being able to talk to somebody that knew the struggle and knew how difficult it was. And, uh, yeah, we just got on and we stayed in touch. I and mean, then we used to, we used to um, have regular, like, phone calls. We'd just check in with each other and see mm-hmm. how the other one is doing. Yeah, but we didn't actually physically meet again until we did the live show. Yeah, that's scary. So we did the live because show last year. Because we've been year. on Zooms. We've been on like... Or um, Skypes. Skypes, yeah, video calls and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. So that's so that's over 10 years now. That's over 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, so that's pretty much, yeah, that's pretty much my recollection. It was also, it was just nice to meet someone who you felt was up here. Someone who also had a film out. You know, around this, we were around the same age. We both had our first films out. We were both kind of trying to go, how in the hell are we going to navigate this industry? And worried and scared. And things haven't changed. <laughs> Just things have not changed. It's exactly the same. Um, yeah. But it highlights, I think, as a, as a kind of a career thing, it's always good to find a peer. Someone who's doing some, something similar to you at the same level you're at. Because you have someone to lean on who can you can also kind of cry in their shoulder a small little bit it helps yeah I think I don't know what it was we just ended up just like um, being quite open with each other and it, it it's easy to talk to you you bump into some people and you your guard is up and you can't really articulate yeah. why but you just don't have that easy rapport but uh, it's just chemistry I suppose although it, you can lose it as well just depending on your mood we've often got into little moods with each other but it's it's just about having trust <laughs> and they're talking to Will <laughs> pretending to talk to the listeners <laughs> sideways saying like um, it's okay we might have grumpy moments but it, it's not as big or as serious as it seems and that that can sometimes I don't know what I'm saying anymore back on topic that's what doing a long term podcast is all about uh, having those open things I have another question from you from Ono Leary Shall I thank you and, Joe yes I really appreciate that and Joe's a recent listener who's found us recently so. you've been to Toronto haven't you I have we had love to the go. world premiere of Song of the Sea in Toronto and I Wolf Walkers I think as well but we obviously everything was virtual back then went to Niagara Falls and it was very cool so uh, and I went to Dan Aykroyd's winery does he have a winery it doesn't even make it's vodka. a vineyard no it's a vineyard we were in it and we were given oh, a tour yeah. by one of the strangest, creepiest tour guides ever. Oh, I can tell you a story. Shall I tell you the story? About See, this, this is the stuff that I want to hear. Right. So what happened was, so there was a bunch of us from Cartoon Saloon over and co-producers. 
So there's a bunch of us over from Cartoon Saloon, and Cartoon Saloon, a great gang. You know, uh, we've such crack together, and we always like it's like a traveling circus when we go away. But uh, lovely people. So I think Paul, no, it was Stefan, one of the co-producers, organized. He said, "I want to go." He says, "Let's go to Niagara Falls, where it's about an hour drive away, and I'll organize some sort of um, minivan or see if we can get someone, to, just basically to drive us there." Can I ask and, you? Mm-hmm. Niagara Falls, there's two sides to it. There's the American side and there's the Canadian side. And which one yes. of them is the big, the one that's got the big spectacular drop? Uh, the can. Oh, I think actually the American side has the big spectacular drop, but the, the Canadian Superman side. Ah, uh, yeah. I, the Canadian side is the more picturesque side, and that's what. Oh, and okay. Just the angle of it is basically the. I think. I think the angle of. And we went on a boat and kind of like the boat, we had to wear like ponchos over the and edge. stuff like that. We went over the edge, yeah. And it gave me a barrel. And ah. like when I came to in hospital, seriously, the photos were amazing. I was so glad. I don't remember any of it. But the photos are still good. So Have you ever took- been whitewater rafted? And I never will. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say yes or no. <laughs> I fucking I just jumped to and I never will. <laughs> yeah. So oh, yeah, you went bus. to the winery? So, no, what happened was, so uh, Stefan organized this, uh, this coach to, to take about maybe 10, of, maybe 15 of us, right? And we headed off. And just la- as soon as we, as the coach arrived early the next t- t- the morning after whatever, eight o'clock set off time. And as soon as we got on, we noticed something off about the driver. Okay. He was talking to himself an awful lot. And he was like, okay, Rebecca, that's good. Do you like that? Okay. Who have you got with you? Who have you got with you? Oh, yeah, you're on your own. Okay. I've just got some people here, some Irish people. Would he not be wearing a hair a earpiece? And then we know it was only we noticed then that he did have like an earpiece. This was like early Bluetooth era, right? Oh, okay. He was on the phone to his inverted commas girlfriend, right? For the first half an hour of our trip. So he was basically talking to his girlfriend and us at the same time, right? And issuing. And so that was a bit off, right? And then he started basically doing these really uh i would say racist sexist jokes right and the heckles i can feel like tom's wife tom's great least lot she's mighty like you know but she fucking stands up for when she sees something wrong like happening in the world and her heckles were where all her heckles were but she was getting really annoyed and she was he was saying fucking awful stuff like you know really 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 sexist stuff along the way like what and um like uh, basically saying uh, l- we were driving by in Ikea and he says oh ladies look over there look over he was basically pointed the opposite direction ladies look out that window there's a, a beautiful unicorn and then he was like oh, you're welcome guys I'm sure your credit cards will be happy I did that you know basically that women would just be drawn to Ikea and and then he started asking like trivia questions okay and when we started getting wait, the answer wait, hang on right, a second he, he drove past he drove past that big Ikea, okay? Okay. And what he did, jokingly, was he tried to distract the ladies to get them to look out the opposite window so that they wouldn't shout at him to make him turn drive in so that they could shop in Ikea. That's and funny. And they were going to spend the men's, he the men's crack, money. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would ask questions, like, you know, so guys, so guys, does anyone in the back seat know who was the first captain of the Star Trek Enterprise? And I remember one time going, uh, in, in in the pilot wasn't it wasn't it Pike and he went he just kind of you could see his face drop and him kind of becoming stony stony silent and going yes yes it was <laughs> it's kind of like oh, fuck you for taking my fucking trivia thunder you fucker and he did a couple of more of those little like trivia questions and when we answered them he just got more and more sour and just why was he angry. asking those questions just to preoccupy himself? I don't. I think it was. I think he was doing it to make it to to make himself appear intelligent. I think uh, he was like, I'm going to give these yahoos some was trivia he? and blow their fucking minds. He was well into his fifties, and by the end, <laughs> by the end, so he wasn't it, right, that old. We got then. to we got to Niagara. No, he wasn't that old. We got to Niagara Falls, right? And Lisa Lot had enough, and she said, "I am going to fucking tell him when I get back into the into the van." I'm going to tell him to shut the fuck up, <laughs> you know, basically. And we said, no, Lisa, we just just leave it, just leave it. 
And no, because he doesn't stop. He didn't stop for an hour and a half or two hours, or whatever. He just didn't stop the whole time. And um, so we went off and we did our Niagara Falls adventure. And it was beautiful and it was amazing. It was lovely to have the respite from your man. And when we got back into the into the, the minivan, uh, he, he started with the van, started driving. And Lisa Lott chirped up and he said, um, do you mind please not speaking on the way back? And he says, why? Am I irritating you? And she went, no, well, look, listen, listen, we everyone's really tired and we'd much prefer if we had peace and quiet and some people would like to just get some rest. And uh, and he was like, oh, so I get it. And he got really thick and it got he started really started swerving all over the road, shaking yeah. the van. <laughs> and it got really like, oh, so I know, I understand. Break checking. I was being... Constantly. <laughs> oh, fucking hell. The whole drive back. Did he really? It was... you. He did what? Was he like... Stop starting the van like going, oh no 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 and he was just you know he was driving just in a fucking mood the whole way back you could cut the tension with a knife and the most awkward bit was when we got there as we were pulling in close to the hotel he said so uh, we're uh, almost at our destination if everyone thinks they had a great time or if anyone feels they want to give me a tip uh, you know I'll I'll be waiting at the back of the bus and we all just got out and we all just walked by him. And he stood as he stood low, as low, a lonely figure at the back of the bus because we all we all agreed we're not tipping this fucking guy because it was a, he, we're paying him a couple of hundred dollars or whatever for the trip. He said we're not tipping this fucking guy. Um, and the following year, a news article appeared online about a serial killer in Toronto. You're joking me! This is bullshit. <laughs> April Fools is. <laughs> And I clicked on the article. No way. There's Hang the on. Guy's face. There's the fucking guy's face. And I was going, oh my God, it's him. It's fucking him. And I emailed it to Paul. Are you serious? The, and, the, and he said, no, it wasn't him. It wasn't him. Well, but there was a hot minute where oh, I thought he was the serial shit. killer. <laughs> there was a hot minute where I fucking said, that's the guy. That's the fucking guy. Um... Uh, I'll edit yeah, that so, so that, that it my... actually turns out he was the serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my Toronto Niagara Falls story, Kevin. I've gone well over. Toronto's great, by the way. Well, thank you, Joe, for that uh, question. Do you want me to ask you another question? Ask I have all a the questions. Question we asked for them, so let's, uh, let's We have loads. Them. We have loads. I have a question from Ono Leary, right? Uh, and he says, Hello, Will and Kevin. I've been a listener for a couple of years and love the podcast and find your passion for film refreshing and inspiring. I work in IT, but I've written some screenplays. I've written some screenplays and hoping to get where you are, guys, uh, someday. You asked uh, for episode uh, for listener questions, so here are mine. Question number one: How do you balance the demands of storytelling with the expectations of producers and audiences, and what are some of the challenges you challenges you face in this regard? Insurmountable challenges, I'll tell you that, because I've only had one thing made. Um, I didn't have to deal with that because I wasn't writing. Any well, the Neil Gaiman stuff, I suppose that was difficult because there was m- multiple masters I had to service. The fans of the books, the directors, and their vision as, when they came on, and myself, what I wanted. But I wasn't really thinking about what the audience would make of it. I just wanted to write something that I thought would be interesting. So I don't know. I've never really been in that position where I've had to. I've had to think about an audience's expectations. I usually just write stuff that I would like to pay and go and see. Put mm-hmm. myself in the cinema yeah. and think, what's the best film or the best TV show that I would make time to actually sit down and watch? Yeah. So I, I, I treat myself as the audience. That's a good way of looking at it. Uh, I've been involved in a couple of projects where I felt it was producer-led. And oh my god, those projects never went anywhere, because as soon as and it's usually producers trying to fit a, a square peg into a round hole, where they where they think, oh, hang on a second, they're looking at the market and they're looking at the opportunities uh, to get a project off the ground, and they think, oh crikey, we're not going to get the project as it is made right now, so let's change it. Once the tail starts wagging the dog in a project it usually won't live it usually won't survive so you just as you said you just try and imagine yourself as the audience try to try and tell the best story that you would like to see yourself as an audience member that's the that's the main thing as soon as that starts to slip away then it's you're in trouble land yeah Owen also asks who are some of your influences as writers 
Who are some of your I should have looked at these writers? questions before. Yeah. Who are some of we my influences as writers? I'm the same. I would find that very difficult as well. Because I would, I would see more of my influences being filmmakers or, you know, screenwriters. Obviously, William Goldman. But, like, films have inspired me an awful long, uh, along the way. Um, I think I've said this before on the podcast. I, I don't know anymore what we haven't, haven't said in the podcast. But it's like I don't think of actors in the roles that I write. I can never picture. People ask me, who should we cast in this part? And I haven't a clue. I can never tell them who I think it is because I can't see the faces of the characters. I just have their essence, their energy, their their demeanor, their behavior. That's what I base things on. And that usually comes from real life. Like, I don't write anything tailored towards a persona from an actor. It's like, it's people that I encounter. It's family members. It's friends. It's, it's old bosses. It's anything like that that I will put into a script. So... Um, in terms of like emulating other people's scripts or trying to live up to them I don't think you can do that I don't think you're going to be quite successful for me I always looked at it like you can try and copy somebody else's handwriting but you're not going to get the same writing out of it it's just going to look like them when it comes to screenwriting I think you have to be you've got to have your own voice and be true to yourself you can look at other people and think I like how they did that and then you will apply that yourself I remember Max Landis, who was a, quite a toxic person. He used to have some brilliantly concise ways of putting across information in the script. And I would pluck out certain things and go like, oh, I'm going to use that the next time I do something. Um, but I love reading Walter Hill scripts, but I would never write like Walter Hill. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know. Preston Sturgis used to love his rat a dialogue. Uh, Dale Lawner, I loved some of his stuff. Um, I used to love a lot of Joss Whedon stuff. Um, and then I just went off it. I don't know. Your taste changes as you as you grow your up. Your taste. And- yeah, yeah, that's absolutely it. You can kind of go who who inspired you. I remember reading um, uh, Charlie Kaufman's script for The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind when it was released before the film came out. And I remember just being blown away by that and trying to do my own little storyboards on the side of the page, just imagining what the film would look like and stuff like that. Um, and then I was really intimidated by James Cameron's scripts because they were just novels I was going oh Christ there's so much detail there's so much scene scene direction in these but bloody you, script pages like you can't judge a script if they're the writer director they're going to write it yeah. in a totally different way because they, when you're writing a script or a spec you're writing it for every possible variety of person that's going to read it so you have to write it almost like idiot proof mm-hmm. and I think I've said this to you before as well that when I wrote Grabbers I wrote it really playfully and I had an awful lot of fun with the scene description and with the character descriptions and all that stuff does not appear on screen because you can't, it's unfilmable stuff but I still like to do some of that in my scripts but I've paired that back so my scripts are now much more utilitarian and concise and it's like director proof it's like there's no way f- the way that I used to look at it or I still try to look at it is that I want to write a scene that even if you shot it on mini DV cameras and it was out of focus and it was not white balanced story. It's just like a student movie, the most terrible version. The dramatic arc of the scene would still work. Yes. That it's not dependent on the execution of it. And a lot of directors that I would talk to, they get caught up in their head of how it's going to look and not about how it's going to make you feel. Mm. As long as you can get it on the page, the core essential turn, dramatic turn of a scene down yeah. on the page if they shoot that as you're saying in any mm-hmm. way shape or form they should have something that should stand on its own legs if they shot it like a stage play looks. with a proscenium that it would still work yeah yeah I would only ever write in not scene directions but stuff that needs to needs to be seen for the actual scene to work or for future scenes to work like you know close up of the gun uh, you know the gun in the drawer whatever it was you know that's the only time I would have the only thing that matters about a script is that the person reading it understands what you're writing and screenplays can get very convoluted very fast because you're trying to summarize all the departments of a film into a single sentence Mm -hmm. and you don't have you don't have the beautiful photography you don't have the score you don't have the performances and their great faces you don't have the sound design 
And I think writers, we can get caught up in trying to do too much on the page when you can just be simple and clear. And mm-hmm. if you were doing a close up of uh, a, f- a, a gun, a, mo- a close up on a gun, mm-hmm. yeah, that puts it across. But you can also just describe the gun. So in your mind's eye, you're zeroing you're in on what that gun. gun is. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's like you know, you're, you 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 have to draw attention to the gun and actually. Say it's there, not you don't necessarily have to say close up of gun, but yeah. you know what I mean. I know exactly what you're saying. That it's that it's it's flow it fluid through the reader's the reader's mind eye that yeah, there's a, this person's holding a gun or there's a gun under the table or something like that. All you have to be is entertaining. Um, That's all you have to be. Don't bother listening to anybody else that says you can't do this, you can't do that. And don't try and copy anybody else either. It's the if if you're doing what everybody else can do, do something else because you want to be indispensable. That's what Owen's I think. N- Who's only written one film? Anyway, sorry. That's good advice. Good advice. Owen's next question, and I've got one off the top of my head because I'm already I've already read the question. Is are there any books on writing you recommend? Apologies if, we, if you've answered this before. Two books I can recommend off the top of my head is I've always enjoyed Stephen King's book on writing. I love it, even though it's about writing his novels. It doesn't matter. It's just it's just about writing, and it's semi autobiographical, and it's very inspiring. I think is excellent, but it's also about storytelling and his unique way of coming up with stories. It's just a delight to read. It's a great read. And the second book I'd recommend is John York's Into the Woods. Mm -hmm. I think it's great. It's all about structure. It breaks it down in a very clear character uh, centric view of screenwriting structure. And I've used it more than any other books when I found myself in a cul-de-sac writing. So, um, into the Woods and Stephen King's On Writing. Those are two that I recommend. Yeah, I've read all those books and I, I learned a lot from them, but I've read them 20 years ago. Um, I found reading screenplays to be more helpful. In mm. It was a much more direct way of seeing what works and what doesn't work, especially if you know the film. Um I w- and you had that you had that rare experience of being a reader in Hollywood, and you were writing coverage cover notes for like coverage, yeah. two scripts a day, or coverage for no, two scripts a day. Scripts like a day. Jesus, how did you do that? Uh, with gritted teeth, I'd be asleep. I would get maybe get one done a day. Yeah, I don't know. Read scripts. It's the best way to become yeah. a, a good writer. Read Screen scripts writer. definitely. Can you discuss any upcoming projects you're working on? Can you? <laughs> I cannot. I am. I can say that I'm working on a one cartoon saloon project with Tom Moore. That's because he's spoken about that in a public forum. That's in very early stages of development. And something else will be announced very soon. That's all I can say. Yeah. The Care Bears project. Yes. Yeah. Nobody's going to know what that means because that's a mini bits reference. But over on our yes. Patreon feed, Will's been talking a lot in the recent past about a Care Bears project, which isn't a Care Bears project, but we just sort of use that as a... As a code name. A yeah. code name, yeah. For me, I've got projects that are out there. They've attached cast to them. They seem to be moving forward, but I don't know whether they will or not. So, so I can't really ever say for certain. To be honest, in the film business, does that even exist anymore? But in the film business projects they're not real until they're about a week into filming absolutely absolutely they're they're this ethereal concept that may or may not are at at any second uh, away from being cancelled shut down in any way so look at that nancy Myers project it was cast it had budget and it got shut down it's so and sure even the batgirl film that got shot released in the can yeah and it's never going to get seen yeah it's fucking yeah that's that's the game. That's to get the reality of this game is that you're working on stuff. We we have almost become conditioned as screenwriters for stuff to not. This is this is one of the philosophies that I've kind of like has, I've I've taken on board. Is that when I'm working on something, a part of me goes, "This is never going to get made." So you might as well just in- entertain yourself. You might as well just do whatever, do what you think is the best you can do right now, and stop trying. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like no one's going to see this anyway. So just fucking go for it. That was and, how I um, wrote Grabbers. I thought this is never, this is never going to happen. But I'm going to prove to people that they were wrong to not do it. A damn good advice. Uh, can I? Uh, Owen's got two more questions because I'm just reading as I'm as I'm talking to you. 
What do you think distinguishes great screenwriting from mediocre or average screenwriting? And how can writers elevate their work to the next level? These are heavy questions. This is a big question. Um, I can tell. I can give Clarity. it. Clarity. You want to go first? You got to be concise. You got to be clear, and you've got to be entertaining. And mm-hmm. majority of screenplays are written badly. Screenplays are just a slog to read. One of the highest compliments that anyone can pay me is that it was a really easy read, that mm. they flew through it. And I have to work really hard to make a script read smooth and easy. And so anytime I get that compliment, and I do get it a lot, I'm happy to say that, I do get it a lot. Your scripts are very entertaining reads, Kevin. Very entertaining reads. But easy to read, smooth. Mm-hmm. I think that's a good indicator of good screenwriting. Uh, yeah, for me, what's mediocre, what's average? Listen, there's so many times you just know a script is bad, even within the first 10 pages. You can kind of go, oh, this is, there's there's a uh, a confidence in the voice that's there in those first 10 pages that usually carries you through. And you were, what you were saying there, Kevin, it all kind of can fall away and, you know, the final act or whatever. But I'd say you can I, tell for, within the first page. Well, quite possibly, yeah. For me, the big thing for me is if there's a uniqueness to a story or uniqueness to a script where you feel like oh, this is there's there's a there's a particular the person who wrote this is the only person who could have written this, and because yeah. they're coming at the story in with a very fresh take or a very it's not even a take it's just a an angle or a tone or something like that that makes it feel prescient and and important that it was written and you feel lucky to have been the person to have read it um so for me there's something about finding your own voice and making sure there's cl- uh, you were what you were saying clarity is very 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 true try it uh, when you're photocopying other stuff it's just it's always it's always a disaster yeah he's got one final question okay finally what's the best screenplay you've ever read <laughs> look at <laughs> kevin's just going what the fuck and you can't say your own stuff or my stuff, Kevin. The Matrix was a great script. You've read that script? Yeah. I've never read it. See, you've read a lot more scripts than I've read. I've read hundreds of scripts. Yeah, I haven't read hundreds of scripts. I used to love... Not. There was a period in the early 2000s when I was at college where scripts would leak before the films had come out. Yeah. And that was really helpful to read a script cold and then see how they interpreted the scenes like reading the Kill Bill script before I'd seen Kill Bill Star Trek Nemesis stuff like that Um, yeah I think we shared our stories with Star Trek Nemesis and I we both had the same uh, idea of oh well they've got a year they've got a year to fix this they're surely not going to shoot this the Star Trek Nemesis was beautifully written John Logan is a gorgeous writer to read but I was it just was, annoyed that he just didn't... He had his favourite characters in that script and he just put everything into those characters. And and I remember all the shins on stuff just being just dead water. It was just it was just, it was was just just hanging there and I just remember being totally disengaged yeah. uh, with any of it. For me, I would say... I would go back to... For me, for some of the best, best screenplays I've read are probably the ones I read early in my career. Like you, uh, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. I remember reading that one and going oh my God, what's this going to look like? What is this going to... And my mind being kind of like just doing backflips, trying to imagine him going to all these different um, parts of his, his own memories and, and whatnot. So I remember being so excited by that script. And um, yeah, and of course, you go and go read William Goldman stuff and that's they're fun to read as well. So that's great. Those are all of Owen's questions. I have a question here for you from... This has got to be... I put it in our Discord because I'm certain that someone's taking the piss here. This is nice. from Mike Hunt. <laughs> no, no, it's totally serious. It's totally, totally serious. Totally serious. The, question right. is, the question is serious, but the, the right. name is bollocks. AI is the subject. It says, hey guys, first time commenter, long time listener. With the recent advancements in AI, are you concerned about it becoming part of the filmmaking process? Follow up question, who is taller? Oh, between you and me? Yeah. We're around the same height, I'd say. I think we're we're bang on the same height, six yeah, foot. I think we're yeah, uh, yeah. They, because listen, I've been playing <laughs> with. I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you there. I'm just I'm just going to quietly agree with you on six foot. <laughs> I have been since I became aware of Chat GPT. I have been playing with it 
any chance I get it, I get, just to see what it can do with regard to generating stories and pitches for movies and stuff like that. You're working with Tom the Moore thi- at the moment. Tom Moore put out an yes. article where he said that he's really concerned about where AI is going. And then I saw recently that Levi, the jeans company, they're no yep. longer going to use real models. They're going to use AI created models for Jesus diversity sake. Right. So it's already starting to become part of the creative process for like that side of yep. things. And then the WGA, there's going to be a strike soon, I predict, for WGA members. And um, they're negotiating some sort of terms to sort of future proof writers position when it comes to using AI where it's like it's supportive material Mm -hmm. Uh, like Wikipedia or doing research it's not actually creative work so you can't you can't use that um, over actual people yeah it's but but I guarantee you anyone who's not outside or protected by the WGA uh, producers who are uh, have a more disreputable reputation I guarantee you we're which going to see... most of them. Yeah, we're going to see uh, scripts which uh, AI-generated plots with AI-generated scenes because they don't give a shit. And but I don't think that's going to be producers. Ver- I think that's going to be actual people are going to do that. Because I saw a TikTok, and I think I shared it with you, of new AI from a company that I, I can't remember the name of it now, but if you Google, uh, it's called Video to Video. And if you take still images... Or no, if you take video footage, you can change it in real time to a different style, like anime or... Oh, yeah, it's incredible. Uh, an oil painting. And yeah. it's almost like dreaming. And then there was another, there's another AI where you could put in prompts and it can be like... Um, you could say something like, a green field and an elephant walks past. Uh, yeah, I listen, I, it, it's very worrisome particularly for anyone who is working in the early development uh, stages of any process. Like concept artists, I'm fucking worried for them. I am, I I believe I I read somewhere that publishers had stopped taking pitches for books because so many people were just getting a a chat GPT to generate pitches for story That's a shit one. I think there's going to be better versions of chat GPT because chat GPT will not do 90% of things that you want it to do. Oh, certainly not. But, and the one thing, the, the only solace I take from the stuff I have, I have played around with on Chat GPT, is that it does lack does lack depth and humanity. You can easily distinct, you can easily look at it and say, and oh, detail. Yeah, it's very very vague. Um, but it's nice. It's it's well written. You know, it's competently written. I will say, I'll put it that way. But what is missing is that human, the human touch. So far, anyway. And I think Tom typos. Tom, yeah, there you go. We need to, typos are the only way we'll actually be able to distinguish whether something is uh, a human made or not. Uh, there'll be a bonus. And I think Tom said something in an article, which I think is probably a good, uh, a good, a good um, thing to lean on. He said it was like for it feels like the same time for them in the nineties when they were working on their two D in the two D run, and they saw that like Disney were coming out with all, had with this wave of success with 2D movies and all of a sudden Toy Story comes out and that herald is you know that CG was going to be the way from now on and 2D was dead but ultimately 2D didn't die and in actual fact now that we look back at those early CG films we can kind of see the artificiality of them they don't look real yeah that first Toy Story looks terrible yeah and all all that first generation most of those stuff look awful but hand, the hand drawn stuff still looks good so I'm hoping against hope that that will be the case for a lot of this AI generates stuff that that we will not have as humans. We just fundamentally would go. That's there's something inhuman, something artificial, and something cold about this material. We'll be wanting the human touch. That's my hope. Anyway, there goes the timer. <gasps> is that us done? Um, so Lisa's advice. Lisa is my mate, Lisa McInerney. She's written three books. Um, she's won plenty of awards for them. The Glorious Heresies, The Blood Miracles, and The Rules of Revelation. And she's also the editor of The Stinging Fly. And I asked her, do you have any advice? And so here's her advice. Hey gang, Lisa McInerney here. I hope this piece of advice isn't strictly writing specific, but as a writer, there's a number of things I struggle with in terms of motivation or even confidence when it comes to actually getting stories down on the page. 
And the one piece of advice I keep coming back to is actually a quote from Elrond of Rivendell from Lord of the Rings, who says, I think that this task is appointed for you, Frodo, and that if you do not find a way, no one will. Yeah, listen, I know it was Galadriel in the movies and this is a movie podcast, but I'm a novelist and it was Elrond in the books. You have a responsibility to the idea in your head, like whatever that may be. If you don't sit down and write it or sketch it or put it into action, however you do it, no one will and it will stay in your head. So you need a little bit of bullheadedness. Sit and write and get it told. You can worry about fixing it afterwards. Well, Lisa, I think that advice is so delighted. I'm, it, it gives me a smile for a couple of reasons. One being that it's a Lord of the Rings reference. And I'm sure Kevin is delighted about that too. But I absolutely adore your thought on the notion that you've got this idea in your head and if you don't get it out, you have a responsibility to it. And if you don't get it out, no one will. And that idea will wither and die with you. And I love that. It's like an itch. That's the problem with this creative thing. It is like this itch that you have to do the thing. And um, we just better get on and do it. Thanks, Lisa. Great advice. There you go. Well, that's another of these episodes done. Yeah, that was enjoyable. It was great crack. <laughs> laughed like a drain <laughs> we don't have to laugh we don't necessarily have to laugh every time sometimes you can have a, a mellow conversation and just get into the weeds a little bit and that's good that's good too Kevin it is I suppose yeah they don't all have to be fun the best bits or whatever And here is a clip from the lads latest mini bits bonus show. The full episode, plus 80 more, are available on their Patreon. See ya, Mossy. I gotta go in and record another one of these fucking mini bits. Oh, yes, this is such a hard I know. <sighs> what are you doing? I, right now, on the Academy screener site. And I hit play because there's only a few films on it for the first month or two. There's only like about less than 10 films on it. And Guy Ritchie's The Covenant is on here. So I hit play on that. And I'm hearing all the, we're out in Afghanistan and I'm hearing all the dirt and I hear vehicles and I hear the sound effects of characters walking. But when characters open their mouths, I don't hear any dialogue. Mm -hmm. Oh, they've up- no dialogue. They've uploaded the wrong audio track. It's like that Tom Cruise yeah. trailer where it was just a sound effect. Have you met an SP? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this film has been up on the screen site for a few weeks now, and they still have the wrong one here. Well, I tell you what, films are actually up there for all Academy members to see, and they see what they've put up. Do there. but first of all, let's just throw to our theme, and I have to say. The feedback from my thank you ballad thank you. was quite fierce. The power of Christ compels you. So I asked Mossy, who is a friend of my dad's at the quiz, sing us a theme tune. Oh. So over to Mossy. <laughs> Hit the cards. I'm fine. I'll get it done from one day. It's the many bits. Oh, my guess what will they say? With Will and Kevin Cock. The best fucking podcast. That'll do. <laughs> That'll do. My God. Thank you, Mossy. You would make an angel weep. That voice would make an angel weep. Telling you. Beautiful. Beautiful. Boolabus. It only cost us two months' patron money, so, you know. Is that all? Money well spent, in my eyes. Yeah. I mean, you can't get much for 20 euro. <laughs> <laughs> Will, you were telling me before uh, the intro that you uh, were looking at stuff on the Academy Screeners website. The Academy Awards, so for official members, yes. So how we, they don't send out DVDs anymore. So how you do all your streaming stuff is all via the Academy website. And the streaming season has begun, which is exciting. So it means for the rest of the year. I'm Did it be- ever end? Uh, it does end. It does end. after the Academy Awards. There's about two weeks, and they <laughs> take all the films down, 
and then they begin again at the end of August and they all start coming up. So it's a whole new collection of hopefuls. So how many films are on there? Right now, about 10. Actually, 10 exactly. I can tell you the 10. Oh, um, go on, tell me. John Wick 4. For the Oscars. Oh, because there's like... Yes, there's, they're adding in stunt category, aren't they? Are they adding it in? Is the stunt category being added? I believe they're adding in some sort of stunt category. Breaking news straight from an Academy member's mouth. Because they're adding in stunt category, aren't they? Slash film. I don't know. Did I see, read this in an article? I feel they were. They... I felt they were. ...have long overlooked stunts. And my God, it's pure artistry. Yeah. And it is incredibly well these days it's all fucking rubber computer generated avatars that's why we should hide that's why pe- these people should be getting their oscars when yeah. back then someone's actually gone out then yeah go back, back to, absolutely go back, back and give dated. it to a man from mad max who broke his legs and uh, give it to richard farnsworth who uh was a stuntman and was uh, starred in the straight story yeah richard farnsworth is, was a career stuntman uh, absolutely wasn't that also mm-hmm. the case with um uh, Machete. What's your man, Machete? Danny Trejo. Danny Trejo. Is really? Trejo or Trejo? I always call him Trejo, but he just says, call me Danny. <laughs> I was going to say that back to you. Nah. I was like, just that. <laughs> we were. Because we just called him Danny. 